This is Pastor David Leistra welcoming you to a time of worship here at Sturgeon Bay United Methodist Church. And whether you're joining us here in person today or are watching us on your TV or your computer or your cell phone or listening in on the radio, we all join together in this time of worship offering our praise uh, to our Lord, our God, for all the good things of life, and especially for his son, Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we continue to celebrate on this, the third day of Easter. We are going to continue uh, with this schedule that we have been using throughout the month of April, but beginning on the first Sunday of May, we will be uh, having our worship service open Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., now, initially, this is for our friends and members of our church, but we hope to open fully in to the public as this pandemic allows us as we move further down the line of being able to do so safely. But we want to remind you of that and invite you to get that on your calendar. We do also want to let you know that you can get information about what's happening at the church through our emails that we send out on a weekly basis, our newsletter on a monthly basis, and through our website, which we hope that you will go to and find information. And especially as things change quickly these days, a good place to check out and see what's happening is through our website. In any case, if those uh, systems don't work for you, those methods, please feel free to give our church office a call anytime, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday between 8 and 11.30, and you can speak with our office manager. I want to invite you now to move with me into this service time with song as we sing together a beautiful song, Morning Has Broken. invite you now to pray with me the prayer that you see on the screen before you. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, in your glorious resurrection, you defeated death. You rose victorious over the forces of evil and established your reign. We give thanks that you fought the good fight, endured even unto death for our redemption. We celebrate the great victory that you have uh, one that uh, over evil and injustice. We rejoice that in victory you came back to your disciples, blessed them, forgave them as you have so often blessed and forgiven us, your contemporary followers. Lord, in this life so many things do not work out as we plan. Injustice and evil seem so potent among us. Disappointment and defeat are ever-present. Thus, your victory shines all the brighter. Your reign seems all the more miraculous. Thus, we gather this day to give thanks. Amen.
At this time, uh, I would like to offer thanks for the gifts that have been given to this church in support of its mission. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to many, many pathways in that regard. Worshiping together, praying together, being together, yes, but also being in the world, being a presence in the world, being an example of Jesus Christ living within us as we react to and live with others with whom we share this beautiful world. So we're very grateful for the care that has been given to this church over the many years it has existed, the care that it is currently receiving, and the generous support it is receiving. Let us pray. Mighty and loving God, we thank you for the gifts that are given to this church that help keep it to be a place in which we seek to do what you have called us to do, to be what you have called us to be. We ask your blessing upon these gifts and upon their use so that we might continue to be the hands and feet of our Lord in this world, doing what we can to make it a place of peace, a place where people come together, where people are accepted and are loved simply for being who they are, children of God, children, your children. We thank you, God, and we ask this blessing, and we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today I want to read you a story about a person uh, from the Old Testament that people didn't think was going to amount to be too much in his life. He was the youngest and the smallest in his family. He seemed the most unlikely of people for the task that he was going to be called to, to perform. But God looked upon him and saw him for who he could be not as other people saw him. Our story today is titled From Shepherd to King and the story is found in the, the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. I want to read a quote from that, uh, that book. It's chapter 16, verse 7. And there we read, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider how handsome or tall he is. I have not chosen him. I do not look at the things people look at. Man looks at how someone appears on the outside, but I look at what is in the heart. The story is about Samuel the prophet and the mission he was given by God to find one person who would be the king of Israel. Now this one person uh, who he chooses is most surely not the one that people expect. But let's begin. Samuel grew old and wise and guided the people of Israel. Then the people decided they wanted a king. Like the other nations around them, God chose a man named Saul to become king. Saul was a good leader, but disobeyed God. So God selected a new king, David, the youngest son of a man named Jesse. No one else saw what God saw, David's father saw his baby boy. David's brother saw a younger sibling. The townspeople saw an insignificant shepherd. But God saw a king. David was a good-hearted boy who took care of his father's sheep. He was kind to the lambs and loved them. David also loved singing and playing his harp. But more than anything, David loved God. One day, David's father sent him with bread and cheese to his brothers, who were fighting in King Saul's army. The shepherd boy delivered the food to his brothers and began to talk to the troops. How was the battle going, he asked. Not so good, answered the soldiers. Our enemy has a giant named Goliath on their side. Look at him over there on that hill. He's going to kill us all. David looked at Goliath. Bigger than big, thought the boy. But Goliath's size did not bother David. He marched up to King Saul and volunteered to fight. You? The king laughed. 
Is this a joke? David spoke up. I have killed a lion and a bear all by myself. The Lord who rescued me from the lion and the bear will save me from Goliath. King Saul replied, Well, all right, go ahead and try. He gave David armor and a helmet, but they were too big for the boy. All I need is my sling, David said. David stopped at a stream to gather five smooth stones. Goliath laughed at the sight of a small boy, but David wasn't afraid. He put a stone in his sling and whirled it at the giant. The stone clobbered Goliath right in the head. The enormous Philistine toppled to the ground. The Israelites cheered for the little warrior. David had won the battle. Now the message that we have here in our story is, you shall become a great warrior and leader of my people. I have chosen you not for your riches or your name or your appearance, but for the tenderness and gentle kindness you show when tending your sheep. I have been won over by your heart. You will serve my people well. It's our story about David who became king. Now, the story is about a time of war, not a great time in our world, when people do things and must do things that are really very, very terrible things to have to do. David was simply answering the call to do what he needed to do. But what is important in this story, I think, for us to think about is that we may think we don't amount to do very much, we may be small, we may be tall, we may be skilled, we may not. All of us are different. But God doesn't look at the differences that we see between each other. God looks at our hearts and loves us. God sees who we truly are in our lives and blesses us. So whether you're big or small or regardless of what uh, you, your appearance the color of your skin, the, the shape of your face, all of these things to God, whether you're a boy or a girl, are not that important, really. What matters to God is who you are inside, how you are as a person. That's what God cares most about. And as we see in this story, God sees the heart and saw in a little boy who others saw as being insignificant, as see, he saw there a king. What might God see in you? What plans might he have for you? Well, let's wait and see. But you, you keep faithful. You keep close. You listen to God. You listen to what he teaches us through Jesus. And the promise of God is through Jesus to us that our lives will be all the better because of you. God bless you and take care. Till next time, this is Pastor Dave. At this time, we'll have the reading of Scripture. Our first Scripture comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Our gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, and our passage today comes right after the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus went back to Jerusalem and explained to the disciples how they had recognized Jesus. Luke 24, verses 36 through 48. 
While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You were witnesses of these things. Join us now as we sing In the Garden. Gospel of Luke was written by an individual who was a companion, a fellow missionary with the Apostle Paul. We know this from the historical and biblical record that he traveled with Paul and he had heard the story about Jesus from Paul. Now Paul's account, as you may recall, was a second person account. He had not been present for what we call the Christ event. He was a young man living in Tarsus, not yet one who had come to Jerusalem, at least not until after the crucifixion. But he told Luke about Jesus. He had introduced him to Jesus, and Luke had been brought into faith from Paul's testimony. Now, Paul did have a eyewitness and first-person testimony, and that concerned his own experience of the resurrected Lord. And, and Luke had heard that as well. And Luke had determined for himself that what he wanted to do is he wanted to put together an orderly account, as he puts it, of the story of Jesus, what we call the Christ event. And it's likely that he had at his disposal the Gospel of Matthew, written by, we believe, Matthew, the tax collector, a eyewitness to the Christ event, a participant in those events himself, and Mark, which would have been a traveling companion of the Apostle Peter, likely coming to faith through Peter's teaching, 
and sought to put Peter's teaching down into gospel form as well. He likely had these two resources, or at least access to them. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to speak with people, just everyday people, who had experienced the Christ event. In other words, those people who lived and were there at the time when Jesus was teaching and doing these miraculous acts, perhaps even witnesses to the trial that he was given, the crucifixion he endured, even the cru uh, resurrection that he demonstrated by the presence that he offered not only the disciples but the Acts tells us some 500 people. Acts being the really volume two to the Gospel of Luke. Indeed, in the earliest collections of the scriptures, Luke was always set aside of Acts because Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and what the Acts of the Apostles or what most of us think of as being simply Acts. So we go to Luke today to hear what he was able to ascertain concerning that day when Jesus appeared to his disciples when they found themselves in a state of fear, uncertainty, and behind locked doors. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. As Ray told us a little while ago, they had had some reports from the women who had found the tomb empty, some of whom who had seen the Lord, from the, uh, Peter, who apparently had seen the Lord, and from two travelers who, who on their way to Emmaus, encountered the Lord and came back immediately to share that news. I have seen the Lord. They are there together in this locked room, Luke tells us, just as John had from last week's reading. They are behind locked doors. They are in a state of fear and uncertainty, and suddenly there Jesus stands among them. No one unlocked the door. There was, had been no knock. He simply is there. And they are troubled, the scriptures tell us. They're upset. They're frightened. How can this be? Who is this? And how did he suddenly appear there? They were troubled. And Jesus, seeing their upset state of mind, asked them a simple question. Why? Why are you troubled? You know who I am. See? the marks of crucifixion? Why are you troubled? Here I am among you. You know, today we live in a time that I think most of us would agree is pretty troubled. Our society, our own lives, dealing with the pandemic, dealing with concerns over our society in general, the terrible events that have taken place in our country, the riots that now take place because people are just so hurt and so angry. We're troubled. And add to that this pandemic which has upset all of our lives so much, bringing its own kind of trouble to everyone. And then there are our own unique circumstances. Each of us have our own set of troubles personal, family, friends, community. Yes, we live in troubled times. But as I think back over history from the time what we're reading about here to this day, it seems to me that every generation has been troubled in one way or another. Oh sure, I can think back in my life to a time that I thought was less troubled, more peaceful. I suspect most of us do have a kind of time in our lives that we look back on and say, boy, those were the days. Most often, at least in my case, I think, and it's probably pretty common, to when I was a young man. Life seemed a little simpler then, obviously. We, it was a little bit more of a future I look forward to with a great deal of hope, and I wasn't very political or really even that heavily involved in the church. I was just pleased to be a husband and a father, and life seemed pretty good. All of us have such times we can look back on. But today, we definitely live in troubled times. Now, 
what do we do with those troubles? It builds its own anxiety. It creates in us our own, you know, uh, concerns and fears. When Jesus stood among them, he showed them the way. After asking them, why are you troubled? He says to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. They could not help but remember just a few days earlier when they were sitting around the table on that day we commemorate on Holy or Monday Thursday, that day when they sat around the table and Jesus was talking about what lied ahead and he was teaching them about the fact that his life was going to have to end. It was necessary for reasons that we can't understand. And, and he said to them, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And now here he was standing with them, the source of that peace, saying essentially the same thing. I'm with you. I give you my peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid for I am among you. And 2,000 years, it's no different, you know. Yes, Jesus' physical presence is not in the world anymore. We know that. We know he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit came into the world. But he said this to us. He made this promise to us. I will not leave you. I will be with you even unto the end of the age. So though our physical eyes cannot see him, Jesus says to us, I am with you. I'm among you. Why are you troubled? Do not be afraid. This is a peace that Jesus offers us, a place for us to go, a strong place to stand, a rock to stand upon, if you will. In the midst of these troubled times, Jesus stands still, ready for us, among us, to offer us a place of peace in the midst of troubles. Now, did that peace that he offered to those disciples at that time, that day, did it end their issues in life? Were they any less troubled by the Roman authority, by the Sanhedrin, which was looking for them? It's, it's why they were locked behind doors. Was their life any less complicated because Jesus had returned? No. Actually, it became more complicated in many ways, but they could live through that time not being troubled, but being at peace. John Wesley had a way of speaking about this. He called it a spiritual uh, kind of breathing in. He said, we, essentially, we breathe in this peace, this presence of Christ. It's like the, using the image of the Holy Spirit as being like breath. Spirit essentially means breath. Breathing in this presence and then exhaling it. As well, And what did Wesley mean by that? He means by this peace is for us to receive, but it is also to be lived out in the world. We are not the only people who are troubled. Everyone has their own troubles in life. And I think it's a reasonable question to ask, do we live our lives in such a way that brings more trouble to already troubled lives? Or do we bring peace and offer places of peace and do our best to reduce trouble? It seems to me that most people, at least if you watch the news, and unfortunately I do, if you watch the news, it seems like most people are trying to create more trouble instead of creating places of peace. You see, it's in those places of peace where we come together, where we come to understand each other. We come to, if you will, walk in the other person's shoes for a while and see things from their point of view, understand how life is for them, the troubles they are living. And in that we find this connection, this human connection that reminds us 
that the peace of Christ is not only for you or I or a few, but it's for all, all who will come and receive it. Jesus appeared to these disciples. It changed their lives. They were never the same. Once they understood he, would, they, he was among them, they became clear on that, and their focus became absolutely clear on what was next. They breathed in that spirit, and they lived their lives breathing it out on humanity. Loving people, loving their neighbor as they love themselves, loving their God, loving their God with all that they are, just as Jesus had taught them. They recognized that he was among them and with them every step of the way for the rest of their lives, and it is no less true to this very day. Breathe in that good news. Breathe in that spirit of God which is given to you and to me and to all of the world. Breathe it in, but remember what Wesley understood. We need to breathe out peace acceptance, love, and tolerance. At one time, the Christian church held those up as some of the highest ideals. It seems we've lost our way a bit these last few years. But if we continue to stay focused on how our Lord has shown us the way, the way that God has shown us through the Lord, if we remember that he is present with us even to this very day and that he is standing there saying to us, why are you troubled? For I am with you. Peace I give you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. If we can grasp that, we can change the world. We can literally change the world into being more like that which Jesus said was going to be and will be and we can live together in peace. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please sing with me now, Christ is Alive. God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you, my friends. May he direct your steps in this life. May he help you to be, help us all to be those peacemakers of whom he said are truly blessed. May we be peacemakers in how we live our lives, 
how we treat the next person we meet and the person after that. May we live as Christ has shown us to live with love of neighbor, love of God, and as people of peace. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Thank you.